I'd like to introduce you to Marco Rodzinek, the founder of NOAA Advisors, London-based corporate finance boutique, and the inspiring annual conference, NOAA Conference, which is happening this November 6th in London. Prior to NOAA, Mr. Rodzinek was the executive director at Lehman Brothers in their media investment banking group. Please welcome him to discuss exit strategies in this keynote. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I have a very, very long presentation, but at least it's going to be very boring. Okay, I guess the slides are going to come up in a second. So well, when I asked uh, what to wear at this conference, I was told to wear a suit and tie. Looking around, I look horribly overdressed. So rather than throwing the tie away, I'm going to stick to the prejudice that bankers should be dressed well in order to hide usually their personality. My background is 12 years of Lehman Brothers. We went remarkable, interestingly bankrupt, which I think none of you miss. So when I talk today about exits, that's not the exit I mean. Because every exit should be a beginning. And my beginning after the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers, wow, that's me. My, my exit or my beginning after Lehman Brothers was Noah. And I guess some of you are in large organizations basically doing the nine to five, the regular job, and you're dreaming of becoming an entrepreneur. Well, I was forced to become an entrepreneur because I did not want to trust anymore another Lehman Brothers. So after the bankruptcy, I founded NOAA Advisors. We have two businesses. We do mergers and acquisitions. And we're also doing a conference in London, the NOAA conference. So at this stage, my story is kind of over and we need some slides and I have many. And there's really, uh, really small letters on it. Anyway, wh why we wait, let me continue. So what I want to talk to you today about are a few topics. First of all, let's think about exit. And it's sometimes tricky to think about an exit when you are still in startup mode, but it matters. And I guess today I heard a few messages a few times and one really was repeated several times. Don't go for the niche. Go for the big market, go for the billion dollar revenues. Don't be like a little feature. Go for the real thing, don't shortcut. Sometimes it's easy to find something nobody else has done. Well, I have news for you, there's a reason nobody else has done it, because nobody wants it. So when you have the one idea, just make sure the niche is large enough to actually be able to employ 20 people and get them food on the table. Oh, I have to click something? Two minutes, okay. Two minutes. Um, so we are talking a little bit about when the presentation is up, European internet. And then I want to give you the unplugged version of selling internet companies. Noah has been involved in some prominent exits. So, is, oh, that's, did I do that? So from my side, I think there are a few stories to say. Okay, okay, well, so let's, let's bridge some more time. Let me tell you my experience as an entrepreneur, and when we talk about exits, what's really important. First of all, don't get excited. So when somebody tells you, I really like your business, I really want to buy it, don't overestimate the bullshit factor. Not everyone really cares about their reputation as much as you do. So people don't have a problem to exaggerate. People don't have a problem making false promises. So whenever somebody says something to you, just assume it's not true. In order to find out what's true and what's not, you have to bring in somebody else, the third party. If the third party doesn't exist, create it. So always, when you think about exits, have the other option. So when you get a call from Google, eBay, Amazon, Yahoo, AOL, whoever it is, and they want to buy your company, you have always another buyer or you have another option, which is the famous status quo. And most importantly, don't get excited. If you get excited and you have emotions, you're going to make the wrong decisions. 
what do advisors do? First of all, an advisor is incredibly important. I just told you, don't believe everything people tell you, and that was one of the things. It's not true. An advisor actually is absolutely difficult in a process. Why? It's a bit like the guy who's holding the lamp, the fifth wheel at the wagon. There is not a real justification to have a banker. So you have to judge very carefully when you bring a banker in, most importantly, who you bring in and how you bring him in. You need to have relationships with your key buyers. Oh, I have a presentation. You need to have relationships with your key buyers independent of the banker. A banker is a magician, but he's not going to create a new world for you. So you need to know who you're going to sell to and you have to have a relationship. The banker is just the one who is selling your complex stories in simple words at high prices. It's a lot though, right? Okay, let's start. That's us. It's boring, we go on. It's our conference. It's not boring, but we go on anyway. Okay, I love this slide. <laughs> Why? Because it's graphically nice done. That's entrepreneurship. You want to go to territories you haven't been before. So it's the first time for me in Kiev. Thank you for having me. And it's a little bit like landing on the moon. As hot. So where do the exit markets stand today? A few things. They're incredibly boring. Not a lot of things happened. Especially we are disappointed that the US companies haven't done many deals recently. Or the Asians, I guess Rakuten is an exception of having bought Price Minister and a few. But in general, they are relatively quiet. There has been one major trend, which is very interesting. You saw some big private equity companies buying internet businesses. That's new. Because in the past, they were always worried. Oh my God, 99, 2000, what am I buying? Well, life has changed. When you think about exits, don't only think about venture capital or strategic, also think about the big private equity shops. I'm sure we make the presentation available, so I'm not going to read every, every point. So let's go on. Now, I want that you are not in this position. I don't want you to be lost in translation. So there is a world out there, apart from you setting up a business, hiring a lot of people, scaling your IT, there's a world out there called exit markets. And I don't want you to sit on bed at 3 a.m. in the morning and feel lost in translation. So let's talk about Europe for a sec. Europe matters. We identified 200 European internet companies round about who are worth over 100, 150 million euros. It depends who you ask. Sometimes there's a big range. But these companies give you an idea how many big companies there are in Europe and why exits market matter. There has been many examples, there have been many examples of European companies being unique. Business models invented in Europe, not in the US, but in Europe or in Russia. And here you have some example of those. So Europe is unique, it's large. I guess uh, we, we spoke about the market size in Russia that you have the highest number of internet users across the European world. Um, let's do some comparison to the US. And I'm going really fast through this presentation so you can't spot any mistakes. Very important, never, never take a presentation for correct. Always question every footmark. And the most fun thing is when you have a banker giving you a presentation, always ask about footnote number seven on page 47. Then you know if the guy who's taking the money for the transaction has actually the background of the situation and has done the work. At NOAA, we are very proud. We have no junior people. We are doing the presentation ourselves and know all this detail. So what have we done? We looked at some US and European companies which are IPO'd recently since the bubble. And we found out that the US market cap is 70 billion of those companies as of a few days ago, and the European is 30 billion. So Europe is a little bit less, uh, or it's a bit smaller, but catching up thanks to two large companies, Mailru and Yandex. 
Ah. Here we go. So the average market cap is kind of boring, but what's more interesting is the average share price performance since IPO. So in Europe, an IPO performance has been 36% above the issue price. This compares to the US at 8%. Now this tells us a lot of things. First of all, buy European internet IPOs. Why? Because you make more money. It tells us something else. The US private markets, venture capital, is probably priced better than the US. So the IPO discount in the US is much smaller. And we saw this in recent prominent examples where a lot of people bought into IPOs at higher prices than the venture capital rounds. But today you can buy it even cheaper than some of the most professional investors of the world bought into. Here we go. That's the red slide. Now, venture capital money raised and share price performance since IPO. So you see some US examples when you scratch your head and say, oh my God, how did they get to that valuation? Well, sometimes your intuition is right. And I had the same by some of those companies here. And their share price performance in the public market hasn't been as great as before they went public. Now, why is this all relevant to the topic talking about exits? I want to show you one point. Exits, mergers acquisition, valuation, it's not rocket science. It's all gray zone. You get the valuation somebody is willing to pay for whatever motivation. And in some of these examples, there were venture capital funds or private equity funds saying, I need to have to be in this deal. Good for our reputation. So always try to understand the motivation when you do a deal of your counterparty. Here are some European high profile venture back companies and the money raised. So I know a lot of people always say, yeah, Europe is not that advanced and the US is much further developed. While there are some European companies which also raised a lot of money, they're probably less skillful on the PR side of the function, but here you at least have over 10 companies who raised over $100 million. So what is a high valuation or a great deal? It's complicated. So whenever you look at evaluation, it's not just the valuation, the number which matters, but the terms. I can get you evaluation as high as you want it to be, but the terms which come with it are as important. So boring stuff like earn out, wraps and warranties, guarantees, ratchets, all those things matter. And at that stage, you need a banker. I know. At that stage, you need a banker. It's not all about valuation. So when you get excited about a number, don't get excited too soon. Try to understand what comes with it. Is there a liquidation preference, i.e., does the investor get the money out first? Here are some detailed points. I'm, I'm sure we can make the presentation available in case you're interested to read the small print. Now, this is my favorite slide. Because valuation is not always valuation. At different stages in the process, different things matter. So at the beginning, it all starts with you guys, the management team. And some companies, especially serial entrepreneur companies, get crazy valuations or high valuations, sometimes justified in the example of Square, for example, sometimes unjustified, based on the background of the management team. The next point is, okay, you're a great team, but show me your technology. Is it working? Is it scalable? Is it proven? That's point number two. Spotify back then did get a great valuation based on technology. Everybody said, amazing user interface, and it's bloody fast. Point three, show me usage. Show me your KPIs. Revenues, EBITDA, and eventually the market leadership. 
So when you want to think about exit, you have to know where you are in the exit value chain, let's call it. And based on that, you have to push the competence. What would be wrong is to talk about EBITDA when you're just a management team. What would be wrong is to talk about technology when you have EBITDA. <coughs> you need to focus on the right thing and the right slide. Here we go. Another slide I like a lot, it's valuations. Numbers, they don't mean anything. The valuation is what you achieve, what somebody is willing to pay. Eventually you find out that somebody overpaid when the next one down the road is paying less a few years later or something didn't happen. But everyone has an expectation in a business. Think about multiples. Multiples are useful to benchmark your valuation to your peers. Only in the context of another deal, you can say what you achieved is good or bad, but then remember the other terms matter as well. We're on page 20, another 30 pages to go. More valuation multiples. Just as an example, those, those kind of numbers matter when you think about putting a value on your business. The difference between 2013 and 2012 multiples are simply growth. So who are the buyers? Well, they are not just Google, they are not just Sequoia or Kleiner Perkins or Axel or whoever. They should be in different buckets. Think about large cap internet, think about families, think about venture capital, think about private equity, hedge funds, and traditional companies. These are US companies which have been very busy working with us and other people on M&A opportunities in Europe. It's a big, big universe. Financial investors present at our conference last year we have this year probably 300 investors coming. How do we rank them? Very important point. And I could probably save 80% of your time. Don't talk to people which are not interested in your situation. Not because you have a boring company, but the equity size check is not relevant for your deal. What does that mean? If your company is worth 25 million, it doesn't make sense to talk to an angel investor or to a buyout fund. Always know which investor is relevant to you based on the money amount they invest. Here you have a ranking by this range of equity sizes invested. So TA Associates, as an example, they don't do any deal below 60 million. They may, may call you because they have no clue how big your company is, but they won't do the deal unless they can spend $60 million. Meaning, they just have too much money raised and they cannot do 50 or 60 deals, they want to do 12 or 15. So always find the matching partner for your deal. It's a problem, I think. No? Oh, here we go. How to sell? Oh, I think I skipped a lot of pages. No, I didn't. Okay. Let's just quickly see what comes after. It's also, I looked at the presentation the first time. You probably noticed. Okay. So, okay. So let's talk quickly about how to sell. Now, the basics. If you want to sell, never say to anyone you are for sale. It's like saying, I never had a girlfriend. Please, come, have dinner with me. Nobody will come and have dinner with you. Don't be greedy. Very important. Be realistic. A deal today at price X is better than a deal in five years at a premium of 10% to price X. The opportunity costs are too high. Life is too much fun. Enjoy. Now... Somebody said to me once, when I asked, why do you want to sell? And I shouldn't have asked him the question because I get the commission. 
he said, well, I do a deal when I can, not when I have to. And I really remember this all the time when I try to convince somebody to sell. Do it when you can, not when you are under pressure. Work with the banker. But not early on, late. Get the banker on board early, let him do the materials, keep him in the background, and then get him as a wonder weapon out later. Why not earlier? Because they usually spoil everything. When a banker is showing up, it's an immediate spoiler because it's evidence that the company is trying to do a deal. If you don't have one, it feels much more private, proprietary. Now, you should know before you go into a deal about three things. What price you want, what is the best price of the buyer, and what would be the best price of the buyer number two. These three things make or break a deal. And we at NOAA, we work 100% successfully driven. Why? Because we want to know that there's a deal certainty. Expectation management is key. Be honest. I know when a banker says be honest, it kind of sounds ironic, doesn't it? But in fact, honesty is everything. If you have one little lie, the whole operation is in question. Don't hide. Show the bad news first. Exaggerate. Say my business is a disaster. And then come with the good news. It's much better than over-promising and under-delivering. Be simple and be analytical. We like numbers. Numbers, in numbers we trust. Everything else is blah, blah. Numbers matters. Have your KPIs ready and explain them well. How many? Five? Okay. Valuation drivers. So what's valuation? We said valuation can be benchmarked. We said it has to be seen in context. But what does drive valuation? Well, the technical Harvard Business School term, it's a sum of all the future cash flow discounted by the interest rate somebody would expect in the market. That's one side of the medal, but the reality. The valuation is as good as your banker. The valuation is as good as your ability to tell stories. But there's also stuff in the middle. The market size, the market share, the predictability. How important is that? If you promise a lot and there's no proof it can happen, nobody will give it a valuation. Synergies matter, you know, there, there, there are a lot of important points which we don't have time to go on. Forget the public market. Yeah, don't have evaluation on the public market on mind, like Amazon, and look at your business. Look at your business individually, and then try to compare it based on, yeah, pitching it to a friend, and ask people for an honest view. Just remember, your baby is not the prettiest. Now, let's talk about the very bad news. First of all, it's a lot of work. It's a lot. I have a hard, hard work. You have to be 100% prepared. If you're not prepared, don't, over, don't even start. There's no need to start if you're not prepared. It's a waste of time. You want to be in control. Dictate the timetable. You have to have a timetable. And you're going to miss it all the time, but you have to have a timetable. Never deliver below your projections or your promises. So when you think, I'm going to get to 10 million users by February, and you are now in October 2012, and you get to eight, eh, not good. Nobody believes the year-end 2013 number. So stick to your numbers by underestimating your future. Doesn't, yeah, don't change your mind. Always do like one straight line. It's kind of true in life. Now what else, what else, what else? Yeah, I mean, there, there are a lot of details, but forget about all those. There's one thing what matters the most. Be excited. 
You want to be excited as much as the buyer. The vibe you bring into the room, the momentum, the creativity, the storytelling has to fly over to the other party. If you don't manage to do that, you are just one other business plan. As Anil Hansche at Google told me, he gets per day 300 exit opportunities. Really boring. You have to differentiate through excitement. So now people are getting very excited here for the next speaker. Timetable, and I guess we are, we are kind of done. Best of materials. Okay, I'm happy to share the presentation with uh, people after the speech. Thank you very much for your time.